Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Bus Boys and Fellows Books Presents, which is our A House Book Talk series where we talk to authors, both local and from far away, and we can showcase the lovely things that they're doing. Tonight, we have Marisa Golden here to talk about her newest book, The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. Now, I feel like I don't need to be the one to tell y'all how real that is. I don't, but I'm so excited because it's really a topic that is so important and one that doesn't get enough attention. So, without further ado, with Trisha Walker here in conversation, let's go ahead and get started. Please bring your hands together for Marisa Golden and Trisha Walker. You can take anything, 
And Tipping is a language that would inspire us and that would uplift us. So we have a very strong tradition in our community of being strong black women. However, the traditional definition of a strong black woman is a woman who puts others first, who does not prioritize self-care, who's resilient, and who's terribly, terribly afraid of being weak. We all grew up with hearing things like, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. You have to be twice as good. You can't depend on anyone else, so you have to be strong. You may not get a man, so you have to be able to take care of yourself. And you can do that all by yourself. So this ideology of perennial strength, on the one hand, gives us a kind of a persona that's very alluring and very seductive, but we pay a very, very high price for it. Right now, African-American women are in the midst of a physical and mental health crisis. We have off the charts rates of diabetes, stroke, heart attack, and too many black women still believe there is a stigma associated with seeking mental health care. All this means that is that black women tend to be too often on emotional lockdown. We censor the expression of normal reactions of fear, uncertainty, self-doubt, and we never want to ask for help. So that our mental and physical health suffers. It also damages and corrupts our relationships with others. Because if we're always strong, we're never real. If we're solving everybody else's problems, we're disempowering them. So that it's really important that as we think about our mental health, we learn how to have daily practices that allow us to relieve the stress of systemic racism. And when I say systemic racism, we all know what that means. That means microaggressions, macroaggressions. But what we often don't realize is that systemic racism is a thing in our bodies. It's a stress factor that makes it harder for us to heal when we get sick, lose weight, even recover from trauma. And so if we're constantly being battered by the forces of systemic racism, we have to learn to care for ourselves, love for ourselves, love ourselves, and put ourselves first. Now this is a book that, like many of my books, I had no idea I was going to write. And it was kind of my lockdown book. I wrote it between March of 2020 and September of 2020. And it's a book that, like um, Don't, uh, Don't Play in the Sun and Saving Our Sons, is a communal memoir. It's a book that starts out with my story of being a strong black woman. And I interweave the voices of health experts, therapists, black women, especially black women who have healed from trauma. So this is a tapestry. I'm not a therapist. I'm a storyteller. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a black woman. And that's all I needed to be to tell this story. So I'm going to read three sections, three little sections from the book. One in my voice. The second in a voice of a young woman who shared her story of emotional healing. And it was really important for me as I was writing the book to have a place in the book where black women could talk about emotional healing, where they could tell the kinds of stories that we often whisper that are closeted, but to take those stories and put them center stage. And one of the most satisfying parts of the book was also, I have a chapter called Reimagining the History of My Heart where I wondered, what would Harriet Tubman say? What would Fannie Lou Hamer say? What would Rosa Parks say if we had ever given them permission to talk about their pain, to talk about their fear, as well as their victories? So these are three sections from um, The Strong Black Woman, and I look forward to the conversation. Our bodies, souls, and spirits are a map 
a testimony to the ravages of enslavement, the cruel legacy of legal segregation and lack of access to wealth, good employment, stable housing, and good health care. And our psyches have been twisted and turned inside out by the stories we tell ourselves and the stories that are told about us, stories that are sometimes seen and sometimes sabotage us. The strong black woman, the angry black woman, the black woman who says yes to everyone but herself. The invincible superwoman, we've had to be strong. We have good reason to be angry. We say yes over and over to our families because the world so often tells them no. And who wouldn't want to be a superwoman? I was 21 years old and my mother was dying. She lay comatose in a bed in a rehabilitation center for six months, wasting away before my eyes. I was raised a black power fist, Afro-wearing, militant activist, and a B-plus average student attending American University. And I had already started wearing the mask, the strong black woman mask. I was 21 and already I was a strong black woman. Being a strong black woman meant that you handled your business. You did what you had to do, no matter what. My mother was dying, but I had to continue to be a successful student. Being a strong black woman meant that you didn't bother others unnecessarily with your pain. In the small apartment where I lived with my mother, my nights were sleepless, tear-filled meltdowns, in which in the dark I whispered, shouted, and screamed the questions I was terrified to ask in the light of day. Why would I soon be a motherless child? How would I go on? I rarely, if ever, seen my mother cry. Maybe she too cried in the dark. How I wish she cried in the light. Despite all that she made of her life after her arrival in Washington, D.C., as part of the great migration of African Americans from the South, there was a lot she could have cried about. The strong black woman is a myth and fact. It lies so deeply that even little black girls are treated and assumed to be miniature strong black women. It is myth because its endurance rests on our need to assert control in the midst of a chaotic storm of racism, individual and systemic. It is myth because it rests on the foundation of tears we don't shed, pain we deny. It is myth because it is so deeply embedded in the collective unconscious of black women that it is assumed and goes largely unchallenged. Black women have made of ourselves the heroes we dream of. All of life begins with, is defined by, and even ends with a story. The stories and myths we create and, rec and repeat become sacred. They are designed to make and keep us strong. But stories are elastic and require revision over time, or they risk becoming brittle, dissolving into crumbs and leave us famished rather than thin. Stories are so powerful because at their very core, they are aspirational, codifying what we long to be if we lived in a world where anything really was possible. So all of our mythology, all of our folklore, our songs, pretty much everything we breathe about black womanhood traditionally is about strength. But we're all of us in this room part of a very new generation of black women who have the language, the consciousness, the tools, and the time to look at a mythology that in many ways is killing us. And I'm very proud to be enrolled in the army of people who are dismantling that myth. When I went on social media, Twitter, Facebook, I saw people, women of every age, even men, say, yes, it is possible to be too strong. And it's time to ask black women, what can I do for you? Instead of saying what they can do for me. One of the stories in the book is one of the women who shared a story is a woman named Sarah. And she grew up, she was adopted by a white family, and she grew up in Pennsylvania, I say Pennsylvania, which as you may know is, is basically Alabama. And um, she was submitted to horrific racism when she was in the public schools. Her adopted white family 
did not recognize or acknowledge the kind of treatment that she got and basically wanted to deny that it was happening. So she suffered as a result of that and she talked to me about her childhood and we're coming to a point in the story, I'm going to read a point in the story where she talks about going to college. I was bright, curious, eager to learn, but all that got shut down. Somehow for high school, I got into Temple University in Philly. At Temple, I discovered black literature and the poet, Sonia Sanchez, a professor in the English department. Those two things saved my life. Reading James Baldwin and all the other black writers, I realized that I belonged to a people who had walked tall despite oppression. Sometimes sitting in the library, those books brought me to tears because I found my home. Those stories taught me racism wasn't a personal vendetta against me. It was historical, it was cultural. I realized that in doing all that had happened to me, the actions against me in school and the silence of my parents was me standing in the river of history getting dumped. But Giovanni and Jordan and Lord and Walker showed me that I had not gone down to stay forever. I was still going to hide because that's what I did. That's how I survived. But I just latched on to Professor Sanchez. I took all the classes. I wonder if she asked me the question that if you hear it at the right moment, changes your life. She asked what I was going to do with myself. I just worded out, I want to do what you do. She didn't laugh at me. She just told me in order to do what she did, I have to go to Howard University for graduate school. I was burnt out, but at the same time inspired. And I applied for Howard's Black Literature Program and got in because of her shepherd. And that was when I finally got clear, woke up and asked myself what Sony had asked me. What was I going to do? What was I going to do with a life that I didn't feel anymore that I had to run from, but a life that I could hold in my hands? So now I had this life, this real life, that was staring me in the face. And I could see it up close, see it for real, because I stopped using drugs. But without the drugs, I was all rage. If somebody pissed me off, I got physical immediately. My anger drove away a boyfriend and almost destroyed friendships. It was crazy, but it was kind of exhilarating. I tapped down the anger I felt for so long, masked it with the drugs. But once I stopped feeling the anger and expressing it, I almost couldn't stop. I had girlfriends who were worried about me and urged me to get therapy because I clearly had anger management problems. The most important thing I learned in therapy is what had happened to me growing up. It's like I'd been in a war, and it felt like a war against me, but no one would ever use that word. I'd been traumatized, and it wasn't just angry. I had post-traumatic stress disorder. All that seems far away, and yet it's all right here with me. I'm married now, and I have a son. Because I had to be strong, I realized that a part of me never respected me who couldn't handle things. I tend to take on a lot out of habit to show the things and then end up feeling burdened. I'm a workaholic, but there's so many life rafts now. My husband, my son, my writing and teaching, martial arts, and plain old prayer gets me through more days than I can count. Now, recently I saw this, this young woman, and I hadn't seen her since I'd done the interview for the book. And I immediately noticed that something was off. There was a disconnect between the power and energy that's in her writing, because she's a terrific writer, and how she was presenting herself to the world. And I said this to her. I said, I don't know what's going on, but there's a disconnect. And a couple of weeks later, she sent me an email. And she said, Marita, thank you. Thank you for recognizing that something was wrong, and thank you for saying something. She then shared that since I'd last seen her, she'd become a mother who was now homeschooling her son because of COVID. She was enrolled in a PhD program, 
And all of those responsibilities were added to the responsibilities that she had before. She pulled, she'd fallen and pulled out her back. And she was realizing that the coping skills that she had mastered to get her through her life after she did our therapy, she needed a tune-up. So she went back into therapy to talk about the new set of responsibilities, the new set of emotions, the new challenges she was feeling. And I say that because the thing about therapy is that people feel you have to wait until you've broken. You can go into therapy when you're afraid you're going to break, long before you're broken. You can go into therapy for a tune-up, just like you say your car. And I think this, this anecdote also illustrates that those of us who are dedicated to self-healing, we have to become angel warriors seeking out our sisters who are not self-healing. We get the right to say something. We get the right to ask questions even if they get mad. So what? I love you, okay? So that we really have to be responsible for one another. The generational change that we're talking about is not something that's going to come overnight. It's going to come conversation to conversation. For example, a young person, my husband's family recently lost her father. She's 10 years old, her stepfather. And I was in the car taking her and her sister to the movies. So I said, oh, I know you must feel terrible like your father dying. And I know you felt real sad. You've probably been crying a lot. And she said, Aunt Marita, I haven't cried. I'm holding it in. Now she's 10 years old. And already she's a little strong black woman. Now my assignment going forward is to talk to her about feelings, talk to her about crying, and let her know that I cry too. And I talk to her mother about that as well. And I get to do that because that little girl means a lot to me. Um, as I said, one of the chapters in the book is called Reimagining the History of My Heart. And um, I got to thinking about our heroes, our heroes and how invincible they are. They never fail. You know, they're just super women. And I thought, but what if there was another side of the story? What if there were things that they did not tell us that we need to hear because we're just defining strength in a new way? And so I gave myself, as I said, permission to channel women like Fannie Lou Hamer, Harriet Tubman, and Rosa Parks. And this is part of my channeling of Rosa Parks, saying what we never gave her permission to say out loud. For all that, I was never scared of white people. When a white boy pushed me when I was a little girl, I pushed him right back. My grandmother told me if I wasn't careful, I'd get lynched. I told them, let them lynch me. You can look at me and see the African and the white and the Native American me. There's been things written that of all the women who refused to give up their seat on a segregated bus to a white person, I was most well known because I'm white skinned. And because of that, the white public in the North would feel more sympathy for our, for our cause. I was still a Negro. And light skin didn't keep me from having to obey the laws of segregation until I decided not to. Light skin didn't keep me from getting fired for my job as a seamstress at the Montgomery Fair Department Store. And light skin didn't shield me from the pain of my co workers refusing to talk to me after the boycott, calling me a troublemaker. Light skin didn't stop the hateful, threatening phone calls and the hate mail. It started right after my arrest and followed me wherever I lived for the rest of my life. And I lived a long time. Raymond lost his job too. And because of the stress of the backlash against us and the isolation, we felt we were in the wilderness. Seemed like Negroes were more scared than even white people. None of the civil rights groups that we had worked for offered help. We knew we'd have to pay a price. We'd been paying it all our lives. But this price, this price was heavy, and for a while, we'll keep getting heavier. 
Eventually, we moved to Detroit, where I had family. Raymond had to get a license and train it all over again to be a model. And I got peace work as a seamstress. I'd always prided myself on my grace under pressure, being made of steel and soldiering on. But all that stress and disappointment caught up with me when I developed an ulcer and a fur tumor. I lived in two rooms with my mother and husband. We were in debt because of the medical bills. I'm telling you this because I think it's important for everybody to know how much it costs to be a hero, even when you are willing to be one. Jet Magazine did an article that let the public know how we were living, and the NAACP paid the hospital bill. By 1961, six years after the boycott, our financial situation was better. I never let the poor stop me from activism. I joined neighborhood groups to get out the vote and approve the schools. Then in 1965, Congressman John Conyers hired me as an assistant to work in his office. Conyers was a great man. He and I got along well because he was a rebel like me. Then at two years later, I lost my husband, my mother, and my brother. All of them died of cancer. And you can't tell me that our struggles, fighting oppression and segregation, struggling for respect and equality, didn't have something to do with them all dying like that. And when I died, the city buses in Montgomery and Detroit reserved their front seats with black ribbon. For two days, I lay in honor in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. I was honored, but I was honored even more by what some people had said about me back in Montgomery when I was working with the NAACP. Oh, Miss Parks, she was the lady who held my hand when my uncle got beat up. She got my kid involved in the youth program. She was the one who came and tried to get me to register to vote. Thank you. Now, just a final word about Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, uh, became a Buddhist and practiced yoga. Oh, wow. And the thing I love about that is that we have a long tradition in our community of black women praying. And I do believe that prayer works. But prayer is one tool in our spiritual toolbox. And we have a long tradition of black women meditating, being still, waking up in the morning and, and bowing to the sun. So that there are many traditions that we have always had to maintain our mental balance, but we have sometimes become disconnected from it. So I was a fan. Can you hear me? No. That better? Ooh. Yes. <laughs> I've considered Maria a writing mentor for many years, 30 or so at least. <laughs> I took some of my first writing workshops with her. Was that you, DC? No, in a library. In okay, oh, library. Okay, right, okay. Um, and I kept taking them until finally one day she said to me, It's time for you to stop taking workshops and writing. <laughs> <laughs> Bam! Maria don't miss words. Another time, I ran into her at Eastern Market when I was pregnant with my third child. And she said, when are you going to stop having babies and write? <laughs> <laughs> so all of this was important information for me that propelled me forward. <laughs> um, we've been in touch forever. Uh, even recently, she read and critiqued some of my current work. Maria is not only a prolific writer. Is it 17 or 18 years old? 19. 19, nice. Okay. <laughs> Marita is not only a prolific writer, she's an institution builder. I've had the fortune to be involved with her intrepid Person Right Foundation since it was yes, yes. since it was a dream in Marita's heart. I've been eyewitness to its evolution as well as to the countless funds. 31 years. <laughs> yes, it's amazing. Uh, as well as to the countless folks, uh, it is uplifted in a myriad of ways. I know both her husband Joe and her son Michael, and I've watched Marina carry out those roles as well. 
All this to say that Marita clearly embodies the mantle of strong black women, but with this book, she's shedding a LED light on the good, bad, and ugly of those worlds. So, how many strong black women are in here tonight? So let's, so let's listen and expand our understanding of this term as we dive deep into this important work. Um, Marita, the book starts with you talking and sharing your own health issues. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and also about how difficult it was to share such a personal story. Well, I'll answer the, the second question first. Um, I've written so much about my life <laughs> that at this point it's not hard to my story. But what happened is, um, just after Christmas in 2019, I had kind of a couple of days where I thought I was having a stroke. I um, was dizzy, um, but the crazy thing was I could still exercise, I could do everything, but I was just dizzy. Went to the emergency room, ran tests, I wasn't having a stroke. Went to my regular doctor, my interns, he said, look, let's do an MRI. And the MRI revealed that no, that weekend I was not having a stroke. But then at some time in the past, and they had no idea what it was, I had two silent strokes. Now what a silent stroke is, 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 is I could be talking to you right now, have a silent stroke, and have absolutely no awareness of it. Um, they're way more common than the more um, debilitating kinds of strokes. But my mother died of a stroke per second, actually, when I was 21, and my father died of a heart attack when I was 23. So I was orphaned at a young adult age, and I looked at my parents and I said, okay, I'm going to live longer than them. So I started my 20s exercising, eating right, meditating, having a wide circle of friends, so, and going to the doctor regularly, going to the therapist when I, when I needed to. And so when this doctor told me that I had two sides of drugs, my image of myself as the picture for perfect health was really kind of shattered. And I thought for a long time that I had done everything right, but my body was punishing me. No, actually, if I had not started the very strict regimen of health that I started in my 20s, the two silent strokes could have been fatal. You cannot change your, gene, your genes. You can't change that. But you can build up strengths that will at least give you a fighting chance against them. So all that meditation, all that walking, all that experience, vegetarian, all that was actually saving me from the kinds of strokes that my mother had. First, a very serious one that she recovered from, 12 years later, one that killed her. Um, so that's, that opens the book. And that started me thinking about my health, my women's health. And then when I went on the internet um, and saw that there's, and of course this was around the time of the murder of George Floyd, and there was a big conversation about mental health, black people's health, mental health, black mental health. So I decided to dive in, and um, I realized that I didn't know what I wanted to say, but I knew I had something to say. Right. So as you did your research, were there any surprises and discoveries? Well, first I had to figure out who was writing this book. And I said, okay, I'm not a therapist, so I can't write like a therapist. I'm a storyteller. So I'm gonna tell this like a story. And it meant that I would tell my story. It meant that I would ask other women to tell me their stories. It meant that I would write about everything from um, sexual, um, you know, um, R. Kelly to Jane Crawford. <laughs> so we traveled from R. Kelly to their eyes and watch a god in this book. <laughs> and um, we, we end up with their eyes and watch a god because I wanted to write, I said, I don't want to write a book that's all about these negative health statistics. I want to give black women something to hold on to, something to uplift them. And I thought about the stories that we read, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories our parents tell us. And for the 100th time, I started writing about Zoe Hurston and their eyes are watching God, and I realized, oh my God, Jane Crawford is a new age strong black woman because she prioritizes, she learns to prioritize joy 
love. She leans on her friends. She asks for help. And she's the kind of woman that in the book I'm writing about is a symbol of who we can become. Well, I learned that um, that health is a destination. It's not it's not, you know, one place that you get. And so that as I grow older, I have to modify this, even this great regimen that I'm on. For example, I started hiking. You know, I walk regularly, but now there's a group of us over a certain age who hike. And so um, I learned that I was all that, but not all that bad chips. <laughs> So I want to talk about some more specifics in the book. There's a section, and I think you alluded to this in your reading, where you talk about mothers not crying, women not crying, and I wanted to have you talk a little bit more about that because it's something I've thought about often just because my children have said to me that they've seen their father cry more than me. And I remember thinking about my own mother. I never saw her cry until one time I just happened to go into the bathroom and she was in the bathroom crying because she didn't want us to see her. Can you talk about that, that? Oh, God, that's such a, such a deeply embedded part of the, the strong black woman. I mean, one woman told me that um, she'd never seen her grandmother cry until one day she walked by the bedroom and she was just sitting on the bed, just sobbing, just sobbing. She'd never seen her cry. Crying is so important. Um, crying, crying, crying. A couple of things. I asked my son, in this is the book, if he'd ever seen, if he ever remembered seeing me cry. And he said, yes. And remember when we were going through that pain because of that stupid thing I did as an adolescent? And you all were trying to help me deal with it? I said, oh yeah, give me that thing, yeah. Um, and he said, yes, I saw you cry. And I said, well, what did it mean to you? He said, it told me that you weren't invincible, that you couldn't solve all my problems, that when I made bad choices, it had ramifications for the whole family, and that I had to take responsibility for my choices. And recently, I spoke with one of the women in the book. I hadn't spoken to her since um, I interviewed her. And during COVID, her partner died of a heart attack at 33. Um, he went to the emergency room, but because of COVID, you know, if you were flat out, they sent you home. A couple of days later, he's in distress, and she's driving him back to the hospital, and he dies beside her in the passenger seat on the way to the hospital. Um, so, she talked with me. In fact, I have a series of interviews on my Facebook page for Rita Golden Author. I've done these really amazing, short, little timid interviews with, with black women about strength, everything from living with kidney disease and how you maintain physical and mental health to um, an aunt and a niece who are, you know, in great physical health to a woman who is homeless and how she maintained her mental health while she was homeless. Um, but she told me, this woman who I interviewed in the book, she said that they got into counseling, but the most important thing she thinks she did is that she let her children see her cry. She said, I didn't cry all my tears because I had an Amazon River worth of tears but I let them see me cry sometimes. And when I let my 12-year-old daughter see me cry, she knew that she could cry, and we became comfort for each other. And we don't realize that when we want to take everything onto ourselves, that we take away people's opportunity to love us, to support us, we disempower them and we really cheat ourselves out of something very important. So it's very important for her to let her daughter see her cry.
That's so interesting. I just want for a second to put people to raise their hands. So how many people remember seeing their mother cry? Okay. This is better than us. That's better than us. Yeah. 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 Okay. So in terms of the people you interviewed, how did you find these women? Who are you looking for? Talk about that. Well, I was looking for women who um, had healed from trauma and could talk about it. And I wanted to find women who um, were not afraid to talk about having been in therapy. One of the most, however, one of the most moving and dramatic stories in the book is told by a woman who found therapy not helpful. Um, and she found that wanting to give her daughter a much better life than she had helped her to heal from her trauma. It helped her go from being a young girl who um, didn't attend school in DC, in DC public schools because there was so much violence, and then went down to Martin Luther King Library every day and just read all the books she could find but still flunked out and got a GED and worked in Kentucky Fried Chicken to become the woman who has two master's degrees and PhD. And what she said was that when she had her first breakdown, she went they, she went to St. Elizabeth's and um, they gave her a therapist. They, oh no, they, they let her go and they said, here's the names of therapists. Okay. The first one told her that she needed to go to church. Uh, the second one told her that they could probably fix everything in one or two visits. And she said that as a poor black woman, she didn't feel that those therapists saw her. Now, we have to say that therapists, you have to go through a couple before you find the right one. But her story is so amazing because she had a childhood of enormous loss. Her father died before she was born. Her brother was shot in the head on a north on a street northeast. He was dealing drugs. Her uncle got addicted to crack and was found dead in a trunk of a car. And her boyfriend, who was trying to get out of the drug trade, was shot by the cops and killed. And she had suffered all of this by the time she was about 18. And she managed to recreate her life. One of the things that I have to say this is important, and this is where the role of other people is so important. She became friends with my husband's daughter. And my husband's family, she was totally different. In my husband's family, she saw a family of black people who were educated, who were professional, who were community activists, who cared for one another, completely opposite from the dysfunction and emotional lack of her family. She became a surrogate member of our family, and she attributes much of her success to being a surrogate member of our family. And so I think that it's so important that we reach out to one another. You never know what you can do just by when her, when her grandmother died, she went over to my husband's mother's house, Lori Murray, who was a major activist in the city. There's a street named after her over in Gallaudet. And she said, I don't have a grandmother. And my, my mother-in-law went in the kitchen, fixed her plate, and said, we got one now. <laughs> so we have to hold one another up. Yeah, her story was really compelling. Actually, all of them were. Um, you made me think about something. A friend of mine was telling me that after the pandemic, she went back to work in her office, and all the white women in the office were on anxiety meds, so they were talking about it, and but the, all the black women in the office were just kind of powering through. So I wonder, I just want to hear your thoughts about that. Are we afraid to take those kind of medications? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, we, we fear, we have a lot of justified fear of the medical industrial complex. Um, we have a fear that we'll be over-treated because it's believed that we don't have the same threshold for pain. So we'll be misdiagnosed and we'll be over-treated. So many of our 
fears and anxieties are justified. Some of them are not. Um, and that sort of reminds me, you asked me what was, I think that was the most surprising thing. I think, I think what blew my mind in all the research was when I did an interview with Dr. Kanika Bell, who was a therapist down in Atlanta, and she's written a lot about black women's mental health and resilience. And she did a survey of black women therapists and counselors and psychiatrists, all of whom were truly black women. So she wanted to see if she gave them a survey and asked them about questions like um, happiness, joy, peace, um, you know, what role that plays in their lives, you know, how do they support it, how do they bring it, what's their happy place? And the majority of the, of the respondents, including some of the, the therapists, said that's a white woman thing. That black women have to continually be vigilant, protecting their families, protecting themselves because of racism. And that completely blew my mind. And that belief that we don't deserve joy. Um, one of my good buddies is here tonight, Michelle Pettys, the big hair over here. And she's, <laughs> and she's writing a book about um, her journey through weight and health. And she shared with me one day that she was doing a workshop, and she asked the black women, um, okay, let's talk about peace and joy. Tell everybody wants you to share your happy place. What's your happy place? Nobody had a happy place. Nobody had a happy place. I can name right now a bunch of happy places. But that is very real because um, if you're a strong black woman, you ain't got time to be happy. If you're trying to solve anybody's problems, how are you going to be happy? How could you be happy? So that this, the, the dismantling this, this mythology is, is about consciousness. It's about consciousness. And I've talked to, for example, I did a one promo with Dr. Pamela Brewer, who used to be on WBW Mind Talk. And she was saying that when she works with black women around these issues, she said, go home or go back into your life and find one place that's just your place. Maybe it's, it's a corner in the house or the basement. You can sit there and read. You can sit there and think. It's just your place. She said, black women come back. I couldn't do it. Could do it. Could do it. And the place doesn't even have to be in your house. It can be outside. So we have a lot of work to do. But the, but the thing that um, I feel good about is we're ready to do it. There's a conversation that's, that's not going to stop. Yes. So I want to go back a little bit to talk about black women's relationship, relationships with black men. Because you kind of revisit some of that territory from migrations of the heart when you talk about your marriage, your first marriage. And you have this line that I love, and it says, and since I was half a woman, I fell again and again for a half-formed man. Mm. So I'm wondering if you can talk about <laughs> what it takes to be a whole woman and why that's important in terms of entering into relationships. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of times we're looking for people to complete us. Um, Been there. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, this, I got, my, my husband, one day, Audrey Chapman, who was maybe was two years was therapist at um, Howard University, but she, she retired about 10 years ago, back in the day. And um, she wrote a book, was it called Getting Good Level? Something like that, yeah, I don't look forward. And one day she called my house, and when my husband knew that it was, so he said, give me that call. He said, Audrey Chapman. I'm like, thank you for getting my wife ready for me. <laughs> and what he meant was that there was all this emotional baggage that I was carrying that was like a force field blocking a whole healthy man. Um, and it, it's work. It's work. So I think that, that therapy is one way, but, but strong black women who can be vulnerable who can accept a man, a man's support and help. And the number of black women who, have, who, who are all about being independent, 
and not say well, it's a partnership. So I think that yes, we do want to be a whole woman looking for a whole baby. Right. So what about the black women who we know who have supported black men who are doing some not so great things? I think back to the Maya Angelou who came out in support of Clarence Thomas, and most recently uh, Felicia Rochelle oh, yeah. and Cosby. What's going on with that? Well, all right, first it's kind of P.S. to what I just said. We want, we want to look for a whole person. Okay, whatever gender that person is, whatever gender we are. So we want to be whole, we're looking for, we're looking for a mirror that reflects our wholeness and our health. Um, yeah, I talked in the book about, um, and this was a very inter another interesting thing. I was talking to Dr. Bell, and she said black women are more likely to take the blame for a crime they did commit to keep a black man out of jail than any other group of women. That is how deep our feelings are about black men and the ways in which they are diminished by the culture and by the society. That we diminish ourselves. That our loyalty is much greater to black men than to ourselves. And that really is something that that needs an examination. But once again, that's an extent, that's an extension of being strong enough to deny yourself. You're so strong, you don't even care about yourself. Um, and the thing about being so strong is that you feel strong even as you're being diminished. And black women are, are funny in that you know the mind-body connection where the theory that your body reflects illnesses that come to you through what you believe, through what's out in society. Well, black women have a mind-body disconnect because our bodies are constantly saying, I'm sick, I need help. But we say, shut up, I got to be strong. Shut up, I'm doing this. So we have a, actually a mind-body disconnect. I did a program at UDC uh, last week um, it was part of the big read. The dean had bought a hundred copies of the book for a hundred women. And one of the women stood up and she said, my father just recently died and we are having to soldier, uh, soldiering through, you know, all the things that you go through when somebody's died. The funeral, the memorial, blah, blah, blah. And she said, I'm feeling very vulnerable. When will I know that I need help? When will I know? So everybody in the audience said insomnia, irritability, weight loss, weight gain. I mean, she was so disconnected from her body that she needed other people to tell her, go to the now now you need to go to the And it's not, it's, it's really tragic. And a lot of it is just we got to always be so strong. And I told her, I said, look, you can understand being on automatic pilot during the emergency. Go in and make those arrangements for the funeral and call the therapist. You can do both. Um, I can really encourage with some of my young female students at Howard that they talk openly about going therapy, being therapy is pretty much normalized, it seems. And I wonder if you find that you think that younger black women are doing a better job in terms of this. I think some of them are. Um, in my own family, there are several young women who are in therapy who even had their children, you know, in therapy. So I think with the younger generation it is. Um, but when I talk to people like Dr. Bell, and by the way, I want to share an excellent resource with you that's also in the book. For those of you who may be thinking about therapy, there is a great website called Therapy for Black Girls. And it's, it's founded by Dr. Joy um, Harden Brayton down at Atlanta. And on this site, if you're looking for a culturally sensitive therapist anywhere in the United States, she has she can connect you with that person. She has a weekly newsletter that's just great. And she has a podcast. And she has a lot of different ways with black women who are seeking
mental health support. We just want to be a community around this issue to stay plugged in. So she's a great, she's a great resource. So I do think that the young and black women. But every time I talk with, with people like her and other therapists, the stigma remains. And we have to remember that it's not just a black community. It's a, it's a society-wide stigma. Um, and particularly in professions like the military, the police, um, medicine, the people who are the most under stress, they feel that if it goes on their record that they've seen a therapist, they'll pay for it. So we're not we're not outliers. I mean, this is a, a society-wide stigma, but we pay a much higher price for it. Yeah. We have a whole section where you talk about um, anger. And I wonder if you can expand on that a little bit. Um, you mentioned that it can be replenishing, and then we need to own our anger. So what does that mean? Well, yeah, and I think that um, we, oh, oh, yes. Dr. Siana Lake over at uh, the University of Virginia, I talked with her. She's in the psychology department. <coughs> and she did a paper where she studied young black women who were on the campuses of historically white universities and found that they were under tremendous pressure to manage their anger, that they would be in racist situations in the classroom, but they were under so much pressure because they felt that if they said anything to challenge racism, they would be labeled that angry black woman. And the, but the most disappointing thing was that for many of them, they did not have any places in their lives or spaces in their lives where the stress and tension that they were building up could be relieved. Uh, they didn't have sister circle groups. Um, even if they had a parent who worked as a counselor, they didn't necessarily go with the counselor. So the anger is, is very real, and we need to learn how to express it. And we don't have to burn the building down, but we do, <laughs> we do, we do have to say what needs to be said. And there are ways to say that. But we're just terrified that, and so what if, if they say you're an angry black woman, if you have spoken in a voice like this very calm and reasoned, they will say that anyway. So you have to, you, you have to figure out what's going to make you have sense of integrity. So, so what, is, what is changing the strong black woman ideology look like to you? And how can all of us be a part of that process? Well, it starts with, um, I think, small things. You know, like I told the anecdote about the young girl in my family who couldn't cry. That's an assignment right there. Talk to that, that girl. Also, I think, do an inventory of yourself. Uh, three things. Have you ever said hello to your soul sister? Do you regularly say hello to your inner Maria, your inner Trisha? I don't mean by praying. I don't mean by asking for anything. But I mean, do you ever have periods of stillness, silence, taking a walk by yourself? And the reason I start with that is because your inner spirit, your inner soul sister is so smart She's your intuition. She's your instinct. And she knows instinctively who you are and what you need. But if you never are ever silent, if you never ever go for a walk by yourself with her, if you can never ever be alone, you cannot access her wisdom. Secondly, can you say yes to yourself? Can you say this is your damn self? Can you say, um, as I often do to my husband, today is a me day. Uh, I'm not talking for 24 hours. Uh, I'm checking to a hotel for a night to be by myself. Uh, I'm going out for a date with me. Bye. Can you say that? Can you say yes to you? Coming from a happy place? Can you say no and mean it? And really mean it. Sarah example, the woman that we were talking about, she, um, I did an event on Clubhouse, and she shared with the group that now that she's getting back on track, she's learning how to say no again. 
And she said, you know, I'm getting pushed back. I said, oh, they'll get over it. They'll survive. Just keep saying no. You know, and there's different ways to say no. Um, look it up on the internet. I can't do it, but Trisha can. You know, that's a bad day for me. You know, I want to empower you to, 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 to do this. So I'm going to let you figure that out. This is not it. There are a million ways to say no. And thirdly, do you really honor and love your body? Was my son who went to the dentist? When the last time you had an annual checkup? See, people under 50 think that annual checkups are only for old people. But not these days. Not when 30-somethings are having strokes. Not when 30-somethings are having the kinds of illnesses that used to be the province and ownership of only old people. So if you're not loving your body and taking care of your body, you're failing your body. So say hello to yourself. Say yes from your happy place, celebrating yourself. Say no and need it. And have a team. Need a team. Who's your professional health team? Yeah, don't wait till you have cancer. Exactly. And the reason, for example, I write in the book about being a cancer survivor, but never calling myself a cancer survivor. Because that would have tarnished my image of myself. And I, a, a, small, a small cancer tumor was found in my rectum. Too much information, but in my rectum when I went to get my regularly scheduled colonoscopy. Okay? If I had not been on the time getting those colonoscopies, it would have grown and grown. But you see, because I'm honoring my body and caring for my body, I'm catching these things. We're all going to die, but we can live in that. Yeah. So we're talking about self-care. So in your research, do you find that there's a tradition of health, self-care among black women historically? You might have to repeat the question. Yeah. Oh, so in your uh, in your research, you find that there was a tradition of self-care among black women historically. Well, I think that whether we were enslaved or, or free, we you know we used um, roots, those honey, those roots, those whole remedies. They they often did a lot of good, um, but that does not that can't ameliorate the fact that too often we were segregated out of really good health care, the kind that would really keep us completely healthy. But yeah, we've always used kind of our own remedies, yeah. And, and also to continue to talk about self-care, you talk about, um, in the book, a lot about the healing power of stories. You refer to stories, your both your mother and father so I just love that part, especially after your father in the taxi. Um, and as well as the stories you've written and read as a source, source of healing. Can you talk more about stories? Yeah, I think so. Well, we're always telling stories. We will wake up in the morning and say, good Lord, that's a story. <laughs> <laughs> or do we wake up and say, wow, that's a story. So I think that we often think that stories are the province of, of, of writers like you and me. But all our life is a story. And in the book, I write about the fact that I was very fortunate to have parents who gave me the same way they provided food on the table. They provided profoundly aspirational stories that were my food. So my father told me a lot about black history. My mother told me I was going to write a book one day. So those are stories. That's all that is. It's just a story. And the question is, for example, if you go into therapy, there says, what story are you telling yourself? What story have you created? What's the story going around in your head? So that's why the book I asked women to tell me about the book they read that had meant the most to them in terms of the story. Um, I know that you spoke with a number of health specialists and advocates for the book. Can you talk about some of their advice? Well, Dr. Um, Georgia Wiley Carnegie, 
who's a cardiologist at Washington Hospital Center, talked about the fact that so often black women will make sure that everyone else gets to the emergency room, but they'll wait to take themselves to the emergency room until whatever is wrong with them is really, really serious. And she would just like to see black women really getting themselves to the doctor sooner. But if you're, if you're afraid to be weak, you can't go to the doctor. You see what I'm saying? So I think that that was, that was a big, big concern for her. And with Dr. Bell, it was interesting, um, Dr. Kanika Bell, the therapist, when I interviewed her, she said she had just come from a three-day retreat in the mountains with several other black women therapists. And she said, everything I tell my clients to do, I do it. I do it too. Um, because she said, black women will come to her office, the phone ring. Can't, can't get off the phone. Can't, can't put the cell phone down. And then when they reveal their deepest feelings, the things that they came into therapy to act to actually reveal, they will ask, can I say that? Or when they reach a point where the, the crux of the matter, the source of the wound, the source of the trauma has been revealed, they are so terrified of what's going to be required to heal, they never come back. So, we've got work to do. So I think I have one more, and then we maybe can open it up to the audience. Um, how do we begin talking about these issues with our families, with the young women in our families, and especially the men? Well, you start talking about it. You talk about everything else. Talk about Biden and Travis Scott Beyonce, and so everything. <laughs> you can start with talking about your family history. One of the things that Dr. Wiley Carnegie mentioned, I thought was interesting, she said that black people don't know their family history. Mm -hmm. You know, you may know what your, your grandmother suffered from, but do, and, and the number of people that I talked to who suffered from depression who had no idea that depression runs in the family. Right. Mm -hmm. So that we have, to, we have to be the brave ones to start the conversation. We may not get the kind of response we want first, but we keep asking. We keep, we keep the conversation going. One of the women in the book said that uh, after she got out of therapy, when, when she let her friends know that she was in therapy, she found that um, some of them would come up to her quietly on the down low and in the corner and say, oh my, oh, is that what it's really like? I wanted to, to go into therapy. So she got so comfortable talking about therapy that she made a couple of friends. So you have to be the point person, the advancement. And I said that was the last question, but you just made me <laughs> <laughs> Because this whole thing about family secrets, like for instance, I never knew how my grandmother died. I knew that she died when I was three. But there was this, I don't know, there was this wall around it, and I kept wondering, you know, how did she die, how did she die? And finally I asked my mom and my grandfather when I was like 18, home in college, and they looked at each other, and they sighed, and they hemmed in the heart, and finally they told me that she had hung herself when I was three. And you know, I always felt it was something, but I didn't know what it was. So I just, can you talk a little bit? Yeah, the shame. Family secrets are damaging. It's shame. Well, shame. families, yeah, the, the, the shame. And then see, the black people, we're stigmatized 24-7. So the way we, then we have to dredge all that up. But I think if we see that, see, I have a right to know that. I have a right to know that. Yes, exactly, because that's going to affect me. It's going to affect my children, possibly. So that um, we just have to get real. We can go out in the streets for Black Lives Matter, but what about Black Lives Matter in the living room? OK? If we can go out there and protest, why can't we make the Lives Matter over dinner? Yes. Okay, so questions, comments, Lisa. So this is a two-part question. The first, how does one identify when one is healed from trauma? And let me just give you the second part. 
we've talked about the strong black woman, but I would love to hear the characteristics of the strong black woman 2.0. <laughs> Well, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychiatrist, and I think that healing is something that's that's a continual process. All the therapists that I, that I talked to told me that there's no one point, particularly for deep trauma, and the number of black women are disproportionately victims of sexual abuse, sexual violence. And so that so many of us are walking around um, with bodies that, that have these hidden stories in them. So I think the main thing is to start the healing. Start the healing, stay with it, and realize that it is a lifetime journey. And that the healing process isn't something that's an aberration. You think of going to therapy as something's wrong with me. No, you're going to therapy because you want to you want to be right. You go to the doctor, you go to the dentist. Okay? So I think that it's not like at what point am I healed? You're at a particular point, but there will likely be more healing to do. And um, what does the woman look like? As I said, those three things that I said, that's what she's doing. She's doing that, particularly taking time for herself. I'm thinking um, about two of your books, and you're going to my new sister in law. I want to ask you, you said a couple of things, it's, it's sort of ironic to talk about male female relationships. I just texted my friend Gary this morning the word self care. And so that's another story. Um, but you, I remember years ago when I was working for the Bishop of Columbia, so it was a couple of superintendents, and I did media relations and public engagement. It was time for my review, and the deputy superintendent and I were speaking, and she said, uh, Devon, you have to learn to say no. <laughs> I had never heard that before, because I, I always talking about on this woman professionally and personally, you do have to say no sometimes. No, I, I may not be able to get to that today. Or can I wait to do that 24 hours later? So, you know, so, but I wanted to ask you, um, what was the spark in terms of where did you come to realize that you wanted to write a book and how did you get to that title? Um, well, the book grew out of a health issue. And that set me on the journey. I'm going to tell you what the original title is. It's crazy. Um, the original title that I had suggested to my publishers was Black Does Crack Strong Black Women How We Hurt, How We Heal. <laughs> now, the problem with that is that everybody Googles books these days. So that's a title that some people might have thought was about crack. Uh, really, seriously. And so we, yeah, yeah, because that's a that's a whole thing. Like people say, you know, oh, you look you look so much younger than you are. You know, black don't crack. But that was a problematic title. And the great thing about this title is that it tells you what the book is about: the strong black woman. Period. And then how it met, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, and for a minute I want to talk about that black no crack Um As a new age strong black woman, I, I have no problem with somebody saying to me, you know, you don't look 71. But black and black don't crack. But you know what I would say to them? I'd say, Thank you, but what you're really looking at is a face and a body that has cracked numerous times and that has been repaired numerous times. And part of the beauty of this face and body is that it has been repaired. And all I've learned from the healing and repair process. Now that's a lot to take in, but you have to say it. I feel that I have to say it. Uh, because I want to redefine. And, and the other thing is, when you say black dog crack, you know, you're sort of saying, oh, isn't it great that you look a lot younger than you are? Well, but, but would it be bad if I looked 71? Really? As long as I was healthy, you know? Many people would love to live to be 71. I mean, so I think this whole issue of what you look like and cracking and breaking, like we have to redefine <laughs> 
Sheree Jackson Dixon online asks, do you have future talks or other places you will be in the near future? I'm ordering the book tonight. On Tuesday, the 16th of November, I, in fact, next week, I will be um, the Institute for Policy Studies. It's an online, a virtual event. So if you go to IPS Institute for Policy Studies, I'll be interviewed by Tony Falarin, who's the executive director, and Dr. Uh, professor Sion Leaf, who's a professor at the University of Virginia, who did a study I talked about. So that's that's when it's coming up. And thank you for buying the book. We have time for one more question. Yes, you got it. I'm not making my way down to Hi, thank you so much for sharing these stories with us. Um, I would just, for myself, um, encourage people to not forget about the elders. Um, I do a lot of work with bearing witness to the stories of African American elders, mm -hmm. and it takes a long time for them to get it out. Um, my mother didn't start talking until she was 94, um, and she lived to be 101. Ooh. And those last, last seven years, I learned more about her mm -hmm. and myself <laughs> than I had the first 94 years. Right. So I, I, I am a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I sit with the stories of African American elders because my mother had nowhere to go. When she was becoming in her becoming an adult and all of the trauma that she experienced, it was she had no place to take that. And she didn't trust the white establishment to um, really hear her. So there are a lot of African American elders who are willing to share if you would just take the time to listen. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And, and as I said, we're the first generation really that's been able to acknowledge the damage that this mythology has done. And that, so we're so much luckier than our mothers were. It's a whole different world. Yeah. Thank you for that. I thought there was one more. Was there one more? How was I was going to say, you got one more question? This is really not a question. I was, I was going to make a statement about self care. And self care is a little different for a lot of different people. And self care entails the mind, body, and spirit. And you have to work on each part of it. And it takes a while, but mm -hmm. it is a lifelong journey, too. Especially when there's trauma, PTSD, all types of things involved in it. But um, you can't forget about the sexual part of self-care. You can't forget about the mental part of self-care. And all of that, you know, they play a part in the healing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm coming over y'all. If I can make it, oh my God. It's on. It's on. And I want to say also, this is a book that is for black men. It's a book that, in my ideal world, I would see a, um, a black man and a black woman or two partners, whatever, reading the book and then together. <laughs> chapter by chapter, so they can learn what it means, okay? Um, this is a book for anybody who cares about black women. It's a book for our white allies. To read so they'll understand black women. Thank you, Marina, for the talk and just bring my friends in this book. Um, I'm a Christian Wright recent graduate. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, just about the, the legacy of Christian Wright and I'm um, curious about the writing process, um, how you put the book together, all these various stories into a uh, book. Um, well, I'm both a writer and a cultural activist, and so I'm very proud to have been part, to, to get the initial assignment for God to found first and right, and then to work with so many people over the years. I mean, 31 years is a long time. Um, back in 2013, I stepped aside, Clyde Beckham and I stepped aside, and a new leadership team took over, and they're doing very great things. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think that 
it's deeply satisfying to have been part of a process that created an institution that's been around for 31 years. That is really pretty amazing. Because what it means, what it means is that the idea of creating an institution and creating a supportive community for black writers was so powerful that despite all the issues we faced during the years, somebody, some group of people believed this organization could not die. So that when you have a powerful idea like that, it attracts to itself what it needs. So I'm just really grateful. And it's great now that we have <clears throat> the Undefeated, which is sponsoring um, one of the awards, and they're just going in all different directions. And um, we discovered people like Rick Bennett when she was in college, you know, uh, Tiara Jones when she was in college, and yeah. Winkler Awards. So, it's, it's very satisfying, but it's even more satisfying to step aside. I don't believe in the Edie and Lee School of Leadership. So I, I wanted to step back and hand it over to the next generation. And that was really satisfying. Uh, how did I read the book? You just give yourself over the process and you figure it out. Someone asked me, what was the most satisfying thing about writing the book? I said, everything. Getting the idea for the book. Then trying to figure out how I was going to write the book. Then the interviewing people being so willing to talk to me. Then realizing that my personal story was going to be a part of it. Then realizing that I could write um, literary criticism in a book about the strong black woman complex. That I could make a quilt. So every single part of it was exciting and frustrating and had me in a spell. Um, so, I guess if I could just squeeze in one last question. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been amazing. I really loved hearing you talk about, like, going hiking, <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, like, I love outdoors. I think uh, I've been up against the issue of trying to communicate to my black friends and family, like, it's not a white people thing, you know? Um, <laughs> and that there is a, a really strong relationship to be had with nature. But I think more than that, like, pushing back against this idea that like white people have ownership over acts of joy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your experience of pushing back against that and like creating a group of people to go hiking with and like what that has been like for you. Well that started with I was having dinner one night at another bus boys and boys, the one in Hyattsville, and um, the we were the couple and the woman had on a t-shirt that said, black girls hike. And I didn't notice it until we were almost leaving. I said, what's that? And then she told me about a group of, called Black Girls Hike. And um, they're black girls who hike. And they <laughs> hike everywhere. They hike in this area. They, they go overseas and hike. Wow. They hike in other states. So she and I and another woman went on a hike, um, a quite serious hike, um, <laughs> about two hours from here in a, in a park in Maryland. And um, it felt great, you know. And then, but then we decided that we wanted to start a group of women of our age, because th these were young girls. And there were certain things, you know, a certain cultural things between older and younger people. We said, we don't quite need that. So we started, so we started our own group of women over 50 who hike. And um, it's great. It's just great. Um, and like you said, being out in nature. Oh, gosh. And you have to understand, we have well-deserved phobias about everything from water to trees, okay? And I don't need to say any more. Um, but I think that every time a person like you models this, this nation, and remember now, during COVID, black people were walking like crazy. I don't know about where you live, but I saw black people I've never seen before. Um, the irony was that we were disproportionately affected in terms of the deaths but 
I saw more black people returning to therapy, going to therapy for the first time, and walking and biking. So that I think that out of COVID is going to come some new attitudes too. Can we thank Maria? So people who want to get their books signed. Thank you so much. And honestly, thank you for pointing out the disparities with COVID and the black community. It's real, it's here, especially in the district. But I will say it has been so nice just walking on my trail with my dog and seeing black families, black couples, just black individuals out and about, not scared, and just enjoying their lives. It's so nice. I'm like, hey girl, how are you? It's cute. And all right. Just like Trisha over here said, we've got books for sale that y'all can go ahead and purchase. Uh, Marita will be signing. Shout out to her. And yeah, thank you so much to those of us tuning in from Lab Street. Thank you all for hanging in there with us. Oh, and I just want to say you can visit my website, maritagoldie.com, if you're interested in my blog, my 2022 workshops, and my Facebook page, Marita Golden Author. And then, right. if you want to purchase a book on Eventbrite, you can until 10 p.m. And then, Trisha, you got anything you want to put? Sure. Put in a quick plug. Uh, I have two children's books out. Nana Kua Goes to School. Great book. Great book. I read it. And my new book, Dream Street, comes out on Tuesday. Okay. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you all so much.